issues. And uh, I mentioned that study that was done from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, about uh, Catholic uh, discipline in the elementary schools. And uh, this is the shorthand version of it from the Wall Street Journal, and it's called the Catholic School Difference. And it pollutes, I mean, it cites specific excerpts from the study and also gives you the information of where to get the whole study. The whole study is about 40 pages, and you can download it. It's from the Thomas Fordham Institute. That has nothing to do with the university. It's a secular entity entirely. Well, so is Fordham. But, uh, uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, uh, but what's important about it is the very unlikely source for the for the study to begin with, namely University of California, Santa Barbara, and this institute, which has nothing to do with the church. So we can't be accused of special pleading. And, and the case that they make is, is dramatic about the difference in attitude of elementary school kids in Catholic school versus those in, in the government schools. So that's the little key for the front school. Another, and again, I, I just touched on it very lightly last evening, uh, an article called Why Catholics Are Leaving the Faith by Age 10 and What Parents Can Do About It. And it's the study that deals with the issue of uh, Catholic children in public schools determining by the age of 10 that they want nothing more to do with the church and largely rooted in the forms of science that they're learning. And I told you that when we have show and tell on Thursday, I'm going to share with you that Catholic science textbook. Uh, this too, the and, one yeah. That I showed you this morning is exactly Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, and it shows, in other words, it's much more and it's then simply an issue of you know, whether religion is being taught or not. It's the assault on religion that occurs. Uh, and I mentioned to you the example of the biology teacher that I had the problem with uh, several years ago. Uh, the, uh, this is a, an article called How to Save the Soul, the Soul of Our Catholic Schools and uh, How Can We Make our, our School More Catholic. You may have seen that very sad story uh, that was uh, documented in regard to Catholic University of America where the, the board of, of, of whatever had recommended to the university that it downplay its Catholic identity because it was losing potential uh, students, which first of all, says who? Where did that come from, all right? Uh, and um, John Garvey has been an excellent president and he really has been Father O'Connell, now Bishop O'Connell, had spent 12 years re-Catholicizing the Bishop's University and, and Garvey has been a worthy uh, successor in that regard. And that is eminently true at the level of the elementary and secondary schools. Uh, if they are not authentically Catholic, they have no reason to be there. Uh, and uh, and again, we talked about this, and it's going to come out also in I think Alicia's presentation. While parents may not have Catholic faith as the primary reason for putting their kid in the school, uh, if I were a parent. Huh? I want to make sure that it's an excellent school academically. That's the first reason to put a kid in a school. Uh, that having been said, if faith is a second or third reason, that's not bad, right? Number one. Number two, if they're not going to obstruct in any way the process, that's fine too, right? Uh, so once you have the kids, you can deal with, there are multiple motivations, all right? Uh, you know, why did any of us become a priest? There are mixed motivations, huh? And, uh, and the, it's not that they're all bad, or and some of them are better than others. But the Catholic identity absolutely critical, and uh, and you can't water hello. <laughs> uh, you can't water that down. And ironically, the places that have done that have ended up losing in, in, in the process. Uh, another article by Anthony Esselin: Reform and renewal starts with us. And the man has just great insights into things. And, uh, he's the, and, and he, of course, he's got a command of the, of, the, of the language. He says, we're not in partis infidelibus, 
we're in party bus and sunny bus. Right? Uh, and I think that's the first thing that we have to realize is we're in a very, very sick culture. Huh? And, uh, and I'm old enough to remember in the late 60s and early 70s where priests and religious and Catholic school teachers never wanted to critique the culture because we would look uncool. Uh, you, you were standing in judgment on these things, all right? But we have to, all right? And we have to be able to say to kids, a lot of stuff that goes out, out there is sick, all right? It's unhelpful. And I, I always say to teachers, uh, how did Jimmy Carter, how did Ronald Reagan win the election of 1980? You remember what his question was? Are you any better off today than you were four years ago? And of course, the obvious answer was no. <laughs> and I think that's the question we have to ask parents and children. Right? We were told in the 60s and 70s, if you got rid of your sexual hang-ups, if you got rid of all these superstitious practices and so forth, we'd all be a lot better. Well, how do we then explain the incredible rise in suicide in general and teenage suicide in particular? Obviously, it hasn't gotten better. Uh, all of the screwed up relationships, right? all of these crazy things that kids are involved with, uh, those are all problems that need to be identified as that. And then the point that Benedict made in his inaugural homily, huh, where he says, giving your life to Christ, you lose nothing that's good or beautiful. And as a matter of fact, you get all of that plus more. Right? And I think we have to tell that to kids and our teachers have to be imbued with that philosophy as well. So excellent on that. And then, <clears throat> um, this was put out by the Cardinal Newman Society, Human Sexuality Policies for Catholic Schools. This is extraordinarily well done. And I mentioned last night that it's important that we do have education in sexuality from a Catholic perspective, but it's presented as education in chastity. And chastity means a variety of things depending on one state in life. But this is very, very well done. It's, it's, not, it's not prudish, it's not, uh, you know, the whole Victorian they used to joke about, uh, among the Victorians, it was how to fall in love without falling into sex, and now it's how to fall into sex without falling into love, right? And uh, my favorite Jewess after Our Lady is Judy, uh, Judy uh, Judge Judy. And, <laughs> <laughs> and when she's got these people that are playing house, and as she says it in her good Brooklyn style, shacking up. Uh, she says, you know, uh, you have a kid, you're this, you're that. She said, when I was a girl, there was a song. And it said, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Susie with a baby carriage. You got it all backwards, kid, she said. All right? And I think we have to be able to say that. And I mentioned the other day about dating. Huh? Uh, you got to say to kids, in the Catholic scheme of things, dating is off. The purpose of dating for a Catholic is to find a spouse. And if you're not interested in that, then you don't date. You don't go into Noah's Ark two by two, all right? Uh, so uh, that document. And then finally, <coughs> uh, about six, seven years ago, our Catholic Education Foundation uh, produced a um, a, a Catholic school identity assessment. And uh, yeah. this organization actually was founded in 2001. And in typical fashion, I was brought into it in, in fits and starts. First of all, oh, Father, would you come give a retreat to the lay leadership? And then would you be on the board? Would you be the national chaplain? Well, as a matter of fact, would you be the national director? And, uh, and it started out as a scholarship organization for high schools. And I started saying, I want to know where this money is going, right? Uh, so some accountability. And I'm simply going to pour money, give this kid some money to go to a bad Catholic high school. Uh, so let's find out what's going on in these places. And we came up with this identity assessment instrument, which has now been used in, I think, 35 or 37 dioceses. Uh, last year, we finished the high schools of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Uh, this end of this year and the beginning of the next academic year, we're doing the high schools of the Diocese of Fall River. And, uh, and it's been found to be a very valuable tool. It's 
absolutely comprehensive. Actually, we just did a new and improved version of it uh, last year. So after five or six years of experience of it, we then by taking input from, from various sources. And it's an instrument that, uh, in which everybody, uh, all of the adults on campus participate. Administration, faculty, support staff. And people say, the woman who you know slings macaroni and cheese on Friday, yeah, because she's a teacher in that school too. Every adult in that school is a teacher. And one of the things that made us move in this direction with including everybody, there was one of the priests who worked on this with me uh, as a seminarian, had worked in a, uh, a Jesuit prep school. And uh, he was impressed by the fact that bar none, the most popular man on campus was the old janitor. And he's figured, oh, a lot of these kids don't have a grandpa and that's probably the reason for the whole thing. When he got ordained, he ended up going back teaching in the school and hearing confessions. And he discovered why the old codger was popular. In the locker room every afternoon, he gave boys condoms. So the break in the Catholic identity was not at the level of administration. It wasn't faculty. It was an old janitor. And that's why we say everybody participates in the study. And it's a very, very probative document. And in one parish, a, a young priest had his first pastorate, a school involved. And he called me up and he said, school's not bad, but sort of Catholicism light. Uh, and he said, most of the faculty are pretty good. But he said, there are three teachers that I think are not carrying their weight. And I'm, I'm looking at that. So we agreed we would do the study. He did it. And our procedure is, this is all done by a survey monkey, and we collate the data and then produce a report with recommendations saying, these are great things that you're doing. And, and it is, it's a self-reporting, huh? It's anonymous, so but everybody is doing this. And uh, so we produce the report and then give these recommendations. And uh, so we did it, we sent him the report, and he and the principal sat down and, and, and discussed it. And he said to the faculty in February, he said, now, he attended every faculty meeting. And he said, by the way, in March, I will be presenting you with contracts, those who are inviting back for next year. And at the end of the faculty meeting, three teachers, guess who, came up to him and said, Father, uh, uh, if you were thinking about giving us a contract for next year, we don't want to come back. And he said, and why is that? And he said, that study, that made us feel uncomfortable. Just asking the questions, raising the issues, already is a way of putting this into, into operation. I said to him, I hope you're going to give us a $10,000 donation for saving you three lawsuits, because he was prepared to fire them. Uh, but it was a self-selecting process. And we started doing this with high schools, and it was interesting that the high school teachers started to tell the grammar school teachers that fed into their, their high school about it. And so we ended up also producing a version of this for elementary schools as well. And uh, so in this packet, you'll have all the information about it uh, and how to sign up for it. It's also, if you wish, there are two other levels of it. This is the self-assessment. If you're interested, <coughs> then we are willing to do an on-site visitation. Equivalent of here in this area, we call the middle states uh, evaluations. Uh, so someone comes, stays two or three days, and so now we have here's what you said about yourself, and here's what we observed, and we put the two together. And then at a third level, if you want, we'll come and do a faculty workshop on what we call needy areas. So, all right, any questions about any of the handouts? Okay, uh, so. Now we are on the um, the face-off between. <laughs> oh, I, he, he left already. He felt he felt he was being double teamed, I guess. Uh, but uh, so between uh, the, the two approaches of uh, and 
they're not diametrically opposed, all right? This is the, the point. Uh, there's a big Catholic tent uh, that a lot of people can kind of gather under. And these two approaches of uh, St. John Bosco and St. John Baptist of the South uh, are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, in, in many ways, they're, they're mutually reinforcing. So, um, well, <laughs> Let's put out an APV for Father Dennis. <laughs> huh? Without asking. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Well, talking about raising your hand. You know, as I look at people, even at Mass on Sunday, people are getting up and walking out all the time. First of all, they're hydrating all day. You know, you think they're in the intensive care unit. Everybody's attached to a water bottle. And uh, but they get up and walk out. When I was a kid, no Catholic church had bathrooms, right? You know, when you're getting ready to go to church in the, in the Sunday morning, your mother say, "Make sure you take care of this now." You know, well now everybody's running all over the place. Well, I remember in third grade, a kid would raise his hand. Sister would say, "What do you want, sir? Can I go to the bathroom?" And she'd say, "Number one or number two." And the kid was saying, number one, cross your legs. We have recess in 20 minutes. Right? <laughs> Today, I mean, you have a lawsuit in the involved, right? But again, no self-discipline. Nobody, you know, everybody can, whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, just get up and do it, you know? Speaking <laughs> <laughs> That's timing. That's, <laughs> everything is timing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Father Dennis, you want to kick off with the Lasallian method of education? <laughs> and the brethren thought you should get detention for leaving without raising your hand. <laughs> As I mentioned this morning, and I, I realized that I was compared uh, to others here more theological and ecclesiological than religious or particularly practical, but I didn't understand that. Would you like that tone more, Father? Because Whatever you do is I live in the clouds, you know, I'm an egghead. Well, and it's like the French. They start in the clouds and work into the fog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And it, and it was absolutely perfect, as you are. Aren't you nice? And that's why you're always invited. <laughs> <laughs> we have our own comedy act. And <laughs> that's a nightclub act. <laughs> As I mentioned this morning, the um, the invention, as it were, of the Lasallian method, if you, you want to use that term, really is inside the head of the Lasall. And his insight is that you bring uh, learning from a spiritual act here. You bring, if I can call it, the spiritual epistemology. You bring this into a classroom setting, and you make this the major method and the focus of the place. That's very, very different from the way in which we typically put together Catholic learning. This kind of learning is a much more ancient and different style and relies on religious recognition, intuition, prayer, and spiritual life as the heart, the most important kind of learning that you go on. And everything else, you know, uh, letters and numbers and geography and all that, somehow or another stem from that sort of learning. Right now in uh, Bergoglio's papacy, you see a sort of example of this. My thought is that, uh, I don't know how many of you had to suffer through reading Bernard Lonergan's Insight. <laughs> okay, that's a very challenging book. It's a very challenging book. <clears throat> and the question is, that's Lonergan as <laughs> Jay. The question is, where does Lonergan get the epistemology 
of insight. I think that the epistemology here, which is quite brilliant and rather intuitive, he gets from what Jesuits know and understand, and that is the spiritual exercises. Lonergan's psychology of knowing and his general philosophy of apprehension is developed out of this intuitive and spiritual psychology of Ignatius. What do you know and how do you approach it through movements inside of the heart and the soul? It is a lot less intellectual than it is spiritual, but it's a lot more spiritual and um, sort of religious than it is secular. When you compare the major movements of insight to the subject, the knowing subject working their way through the spiritual exercises, you see the correspondence. What am I saying about Bergoglio? I'm saying that Bergoglio's project right now seems to me to take the spiritual exercises and he's trying to develop an ecclesiology out of them. And that what you and I are watching is a Jesuit ecclesiology drawn from Ignatius being girded down on top of the church universal. To some extent, to some extent, it works. In other ways, I don't think it works at all. I don't think it's big enough for what universal symbolizes. When Bergoglio talks a lot about, for example, accompaniment, that's a very Jesuit sort of, of, of concept. He talks about <clears throat> um, movements and ways of knowing. He talks about the kind of church that is the community of those making this exercise. I, I see a big correspondence between what Bergoglio knows, and Bergoglio knows this. Bergoglio is SJ. And SJ has this separate kind of, of world of great merit and great depth and great beauty, no doubt. I'm only bringing this up to show you a modern day example. If I take Jesuit epistemology and spirituality and ecclesiology seriously, then my Jesuit life and learning would start here. This would be an example. This would be the the inclination of a de la Salle, you go to the spiritual heart of something and you learn from there. You don't do this. You don't say, we're going to have one heck of a fine Catholic school. We're going to say our prayers in the morning and then we're going to bring in every expert in every field and beef up our curriculum and put together the latest, newest methods of knowing and uh, everything appropriate to every age level and they're all secular and they don't integrate and they don't come together in any kind of spiritual epistemology no spiritual way of knowing no systemic way of putting faith at the center they don't but you have a hell of a fine professional school and the kids scores are you know off the charts and everybody says my kid got into yale you know <clears throat> when I was head of two Catholic high schools, everybody judged in the end the value of the school, sadly, by where the seniors were admitted to into college. There would be five going to Stanford and two going to Harvard and six going to UCLA and five going, you know, like that and like that. And they'd say, see, there you are. That, that's the value of a Catholic education right there. We got in. We are a success according to what standard? We are a success according to basically the secularized standards which major universities expect every competent student to have their hands on. Now, those standards change, mind you. Like, for example, I just noticed, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I just noticed that. Yale dropped for sure any further flirting with the use of those admissions essays, okay? And then the article I was reading, I think it was in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, went on to say that only 22% now of higher education 
uh, institutions in the U.S. even care about those essays. Side note, why would that be? Why don't you want to know how students can write? Probable answer. There is such an underground of cheating on those essays and professionals who write them for you at least correct them and spruce them up and make them look good that when seniors in high school submit those to colleges, they look at them and say, this is not their work, okay? I would rather have your English teacher send me a copy of what he or she thinks was your best essay as a senior and let them decide that. Let your history prof send me your best research paper and they choose it, you don't choose it. You keep your fingers off of it and that way I see how you really write. So writing these essays and sending them in and, and all the, the touting of oneself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> these are success markers according to the world. What it looks to me the saints do is not worry about those kinds of things. They start in a different place. The anthropology of the believer is some kind of act of knowing God in Christ Jesus and some sort of spiritual capacity or faculty. And that's where they begin to build the learning exercise and the learning capability of the students right there. They start there. They don't start with high technical competence and not all the rest of that. That's a major kind of a shift. That's not what we're used to. What we're used to, I think, at least in the schools as I ran them, shame on me, is that the piety and the prayerfulness and all that might be pervasive in a school, but it's compartmentalized off, okay? So here's the religion curriculum, and here's campus ministry, okay, for service, all that wonderful stuff. And here's prayer life and retreats. And if we're lucky enough to have a priest, we bring in the sacraments, okay? And then over here is the real reason I'm going to school, which is, you know, AP courses and admissions to the best college and et cetera, and uh, the finest teachers and people who are well qualified. Now, where do these two come together? What the saints are suggesting is that first of all, this kind of knowing has to be the first step of all knowing in a Catholic education. You start from within the soul. You don't start simply over here from within the manipulative cognitive intellect that says, I can manage. That's not where you do it. A real Catholic education starts here, and then these two things are somehow integrated. They're brought together. They're made, you are made to see how they relate to each other. I will be dating myself by saying this, okay? When I was a kid, Hello. when I was a kid, our grammar books in grade school were quite thick and quite demanding. But it was interesting what we first learned to read and what we were taught to analyze grammatically. The first things we were taught were not uh, see, spot, run, things like that. The first things we were taught were the Our Father. There'd be big illuminated pages, you know, of very beautiful things that little children would look at. They say, this is a noun, and this is a verb, and this is a capital N, and so forth and so on. I remember in third grade that we had a major kind of lesson on the Apostles' Creed as an English lesson, not as a religion lesson. In other words, you take what is the statement of belief, you take this and you, you build out from there in its assertions, whether it is a written expression, it is syntax, it's vocabulary, etc. You grow it out from there. And then, you know, it's infinite. The kind of literature you want to read, everything you want to read. But you start in a very different place than what we do now. What we do now is we tend to take spiritual learning and kind of put it side by side with secular learning and secular models. 
and we insist that the secular had better be first class and that you succeed. If you don't get your prayers done and you don't really stand, well, that's okay. You know, did you show up? You did. Is your uniform clean? Were right. well, you nice to the sisters? Okay, that's okay. The saints would say, no, 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 no. You've got this, I'm not quite upside down, but you've got this lopsided anyway. In the end, <clears throat> when you face the Lord at the hour of death, he will ask you some questions, <laughs> but he will not ask you, um, uh, why did you screw up chapter seven in that planar geometry thing? <laughs> like, you, you, know, what, you, you don't get molecular stuff anymore? What was the deal with that? You just, you blew that lab experiment? That's, you know. John of the Cross says, yeah, there's a final exam. And the final exam consists in one illuminating question that has to come from within. How well did you love me? That's what he's asking. He didn't ask how confident were you? Weren't you president of the United States? Weren't you captain of the football team? Weren't you a millionaire? He doesn't care about that. He asks from within. There's a different point of departure and a different kind of learning and knowing that is proposed here. So when you speak about the Lasallian method, it's the point of departure that matters the most. And that point of departure is taken from the interior life of the teacher, the interior life of the monk, of the De La Salle brother. That's where it comes from. It was so structured up that the reigning language of the classroom in the Lasallian school was silent. That's what you were taught, first of all. Actually, when you enter the De La Salle brothers, the first word that you learn that dies on the first day is amen. Mm -hmm. I remember as far as joints, <laughs> the novice director would give us that look, you know. You don't say amen, you say ainsi soit-il. <laughs> and so it is, you know, that's the way it is, yeah. Because the French don't say amen, they say ainsi soit-il. You learn from within a different way, a different style. And what is it? What is that point of departure inside of the life of the monk, the interior life of the one given to it? It is for De La Salle one simple thing that cannot be learned apart from the vocabulary and syntax of silence. And it is this, the starting point here, the way you learn, what you learn, how you learn, is all about the presence of God, the practice of the presence of God. That's what you do. When you learn this, you will learn a new method for learning everything else. That's the Lasallian method. Do you remember that story? I love this story. It's about uh, Jean Vianney who, as you know, was ordained uh, as a simplex priest. They thought he was dumb as a brick and shouldn't hear confessions. It'd be dangerous to let that boy into a confession. All right. So in his first assignment, of says, Saint-Marie, the pastor said, okay, Father, after mass, you can arrange the flowers. <laughs> Very good. So <laughs> Vianney is like, hello, 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 hello. <laughs> and he's going around pulling dead leaves off things, you know, like watering things. <laughs> yes. uh, and he sees this old farmer come in to the back of the church and he kicks off his big dirty sabot, the wooden shoes, comes in like this, you know, sits right here. And he's in the back pew and he's staring at the tabernacle. And Vienne, who is young and dumb, <laughs> He's looking So he's making flower stuff for a long time and finally decides he will he will work his way back subtle as a hemorrhoid, huh? He's gonna work <laughs> to the guy in the back, you know, like the guy would notice that. And he says to him, Hello <clears throat> Monsieur so, 
Hear me? And then he says, get, get to shape. What are you doing here? Don't you have work to do? You're a farmer. The crops are high. It's a beautiful day. Why are you here? And the farmer looks at Vianney like Vianney had two heads. And he says, I look at him and he looks at me. Period. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Go away, little bothersome priest. Okay. And Vianney is at first very struck by this. He's like, you stare at the Lord and he stares at you. What are you saying? What are you saying? I must go think about this. <laughs> he tells this story on himself later over and over and over and over. Because what he's talking about is this. The old man in the back learns the presence of God by allowing himself to be open to God and letting God come in. We know in this way, we apprehend God in this way by an exchange of presence. Plans and programs are not presence. They are not the same thing. And this morning I was very struck by the Salesian Father's constant uh, refrain of presence. For De La Salle, it is this. You must, he said to your brothers and to the children, learn how to, as he said, fall, don't be, fall into the presence of God, wherever you are, and you will learn everything. The only language that can encompass that is complete silence. When you are working, you're working in silence. When the brother who is in charge of the classroom needs something from you, he comes to you and he taps this on the desk. He hands you a new pencil or something and, and he indicates. He does, not, he does not constantly chatter and give direction. It's an interiorization of many things. Every 30 minutes in a De La Salle classroom. Now it would stop. It stopped just at the time of the council, at least in the grade schools, because the brothers had mostly grade schools. In the US, they had mostly high schools, but I taught in one of their grade schools. Is that every 30 minutes, one of the students was um, tasked with ringing a little bell. Okay. Here's the little bell is suddenly like and in 30 minutes, the, <laughs> the brother would say, Vive Jesus de Nacar, live Jesus in our hearts. And everyone would say, A jamais, forever. And then go back to their work. They are writing, they are this, they are that. And then the father that spoke to us last night, his son graduated from CBA, and he's talked about that very point, huh? That the kids to this day do that at CBA. Yeah. In other words, it's the 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 practice of recollection. It would be the broader spiritual term. How do you promote recollection of the self as an aid to learning? It's very different, you know. So every thirty minutes there would be this exercise in order that your practice of the presence of God, inside of which the learning goes on, uh, is uninterrupted. Now, underneath this, you have to begin to say to De La Salle, oh, did you think this through? <laughs> or what, you know? What is it exactly that you think is going on here? How, how do people learn? And De La Salle's answer was, that this is a kind of pneumatological thing. You turn yourself over to the spirit and the spirit will take you where you need to go. And the brother teacher will show you, will guide you, will guide you. But he said, going back to your other point this morning, Father, he defined the relationship of the student to the brother as one of disciple he uses this term they are not to be called les étudiants but les disciples the disciples of each brother so that each friar was responsible for the spiritual growth of the kids in front of it and that's number one 
The rest of it will come about as it needs to come about. It's not to say in all of this that technical competence is not important. It's to put it in a certain place relative to spiritual competence. Can I call it that? And also not to say that other forms of learning are not only possible but important, but to say that a spiritual form of learning should be at the center, should be first, and should inform other kinds of things. It's very daring. It's very unusual. It says it's a kind of pneumatology of learning. That the Holy Spirit takes over inside of each kid. And your job as a teacher is to guarantee that exposure constantly to the Holy Spirit. Constantly, constantly, constantly. And you develop a certain eye for looking at their behavior to see whether it corresponds with the life of the Spirit. Everything in the school is sort of put together around this. I'm not sure we have anything quite like this anymore, or a whole school put together like it. But I did visit a Montessori school, a Catholic Montessori school in Rome. Okay, one that Maria Montessori had, you know, had a hand in, and so on and so on. And it was very little children, you know. And uh, I was kind of being sitting on one of those chairs, and they were. They, <laughs> what are you doing? And they were, as you know, when you want to educate a Montessori child about going to Mass, they have the instrumenta of Mass. They have a chalice and they have the missile and they have a child size. And they have the child manipulate these things and move them. And then the teacher and the children say prayers together. They don't make priests out of the little kids, but they make the little kids familiar with holy things. They push them right up to see holy things. Their room is full of holy things. There are images of Our Lady and all that. There is holy water. There are candles to light. There is song to be sung. There is prayer constantly in a Montessori school. And behavior is very much linked to the spiritual center. It's not behavior is a code and we expect you to follow it while we get you really interested in this lesson on volcanoes. It's okay, but that's really a public school, isn't it? You know? It might be a public school with a Catholic name on it. Catholic education that starts in the center that's different, that's, that's really something. That's very, very different. That would be a great experiment to have. Now, <clears throat> if you're going to do this, of course, what it means is that you have to have a critical mass of people devoted to this, the practice of the presence of God, to a whole life given up to this, to religion in this way, and that it opens up to young people this experience. Well, when I entered the Brothers, it's 51 years ago, there were 21,500 De La Salle brothers. Today, there are 3,400. Can you imagine the devastation of that? In 50 years, 3,400 are left. And most of them are French, Indian, and they're also older French, okay? So when the French brothers die out, you're going to have 500, okay? And of the 500, 20 of them are, you know, and yeah, no, at this beautiful school. Oh, yeah, CBA, yeah. CBA. And there'll be some retired brothers <laughs> in different countries. But you've lost this. Okay? This is gone. This whole, it's not just the loss of a religious family. It's the loss of a tradition of knowing and teaching and putting together a school inside of spiritual experience. That's lost. Okay? To revive something like this, at first, I think this would look very odd. You'd have to reinvent this in a new half way that makes sense, you know, to the culture. <clears throat> Imagine reconceiving of what goes on in a modern classroom through a spiritual lens like this, and then coming up with structures, support structures, 
and activities that flow and blend from it? Well, that's very different. That's the Lasallian method. That's the heart of it. The mistake that you hear when people say, oh, the Lasallian method, I know what that is, <laughs> was this incidental incident that, that happened in the LaSalle's uh, experience of opening these parish schools is that he was a pretty shrewd observer of kids, I must say, he was pretty shrewd. And he would watch, at first, he hired all these rather rough-edged schoolmasters, these lay guys, who said, uh, no, Father, I will show you, okay, you just give us the money, <laughs> and we'll show you how to run this school. <clears throat> De La Salle had his own ideas, so he's watching the schoolmasters. And the method was that you would have whichever little urchins showed up that day, you'd put them all in a room. They'd be playing games and beating the snot out of each other and running around while the schoolmaster dealt with them one on one. And you would have the first little one sit in front and go, Okay, all right. You do this for 20 minutes, and there's pandemonium, absolute pandemonium, and nobody cared. Okay, bloody noses and all the rest of that. Today's public school. <laughs> <laughs> so De La Salle says, This is crazy. This is crazy. I don't want this. I'm going to show the brothers and the schoolmasters first before they turn into religious. <laughs> I'm going to show them how to instruct a whole group of people with simultaneous method of instruction. Instead of this little tiny stuff and this going back and forth in this chaos, he said, I want to put together a room full of kids this way. How do you get rid of the chaos? Recollection. How do you get the brother to be interested in starting first with what is important in the heart of the child? practice of the presence of God. And so he builds outward. But his simultaneous method, which educational historians sees on as a great poem of turning. And then, yeah. Okay. You're misunderstanding it. It grows out of this. It doesn't grow simply out of common sense and practicality. It's a different, there's a different <laughs> word <to it. clears throat> So in educational history books and textbooks, if somebody mentions the Lasallian method and the footnote, it means uh, instruction to multiple students at the same time. You lose the background of where it came from. That's what we should get. It's like non-Catholic Montessori schools. It's absurd. So to speak. Yeah, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, Questions or? Well, two points Father mentions about disciples. I think it's important for us <clears throat> First of all, as priests, but also teachers, I always say, you have to be a disciple before you can be a teacher. And this is one of the mistakes that's often made in, in priestly formation. There's no concern, or there's a presumption, huh, that everyone is already a disciple. Or you can't be a father until you've first been a son. Uh, and with teachers, huh, uh, we're asking them to teach without determining whether, first of all, they've been disciples, and, and therein is part of the problem as well. And then Father Dennis talks about the, uh, the practice of, of silence. In that horribly messed up high school that I alluded to this morning, uh, with no religious environment, et cetera, <clears throat> I, discover, I, I discovered that in the 14 years of the existence of the school, they had never had a retreat, yeah, right. period. And again, that pre, that included pre-Vatican II era. Never a retreat, never a day of recollection, nothing, right? And and so I get there, and I'm shocked to discover that, and I thought, how do we deal with this? So I thought, well, let's deal with the freshmen. They don't know any better. <laughs> and so we're going to have a freshman evening of recollection. And so there was a little talk, and there was some kind of a video about some saint, and blah, 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 and we had some pizza, and then we had exposition of the Blessed Sacrament and, um, and Compline and uh, Benediction. <clears throat> and the chapel was an interesting one. It was constructed in 1962 
and it was avant-garde. It was a church in the round, which of course meant by the time of the 1970s, it was already obsolete because you always had somebody at your back. And when you were preaching, you were like on a tilt-a-whirl because you kept turning around to see whom do you speak at what time. <laughs> at any rate, as we had exposition, two of the freshman boys were serving and I kind of heard some sniffles. I thought, what's going on? Then I kind of looked out the corner of my eye and I saw this one kid. There was a little tear coming down. And I looked at the, and these are big jocks, you know, freshmen that are already playing on a JV football team. All right. And I said, another little tear. I don't know what's going on. And so we finish the service. We get back into the sacristy. And I said, all right, boys, let's clean up. You know, very formal. And, and, and I said, um, by the way, um, were, were you guys uh, crying about something? Oh, oh we're, we're, we're great. You know, no. I said, well, you know, if I said something that caused some concern or what? No, 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 no. And then the one kid said, yeah, I, I, I was crying. I said, and why is that? He said, I've never felt so close to God in my life. They had, I took for granted, having grown up with exposition and benediction, these kids had never seen it before. And this goes to Father Christopher's that's point. Father Christopher's saying, yeah. quite interesting. That's right. And these kids were mesmerized by it. And it brought them, first of all, to the first experience of prayer that wasn't constant noise and movement and all the rest of it. And, and they would regularly ask for this. In one of the LA high schools that I evaluated, uh, uh, Father Sarah High School, uh, which is the most largely non-Catholic population of any of the 51 high schools of the archdiocese, 72% of the kids are not Catholic. Most of them are black. And when I do these high school visits, one of the groups I meet with is the student council. And so a bunch of these kids were, you know, black kids, most of them not Catholic. And I said, what's the thing you enjoy most about the high school? And this black girl said, I love that Eucharistic adoration. And, and without knowing a thing about the Vianney story, I said, she said, I said, why? She said, I just go in and look at Jesus and talk to him and listen. To him. And interesting, that school, the most non-Catholic population, has the most seminarians in the archdiocese come from that school. Is that right? It's quite interesting. When Father Chris was talking this morning about introducing adoration, a kid introducing children to adoration, it's a very important spiritual exercise, but also very self-disclosive. They learn something about who they are in a learning mode they have never turned on before. That's that's the difference. It's apprehensive, it's intuitive, it's heartfelt, and it's different. That's where you would start a Catholic education and expand. At Georgetown, as I call it, Jorge Palo, just do back down. I <laughs> <laughs> say, so, so, welcome to Jorge Palo. And you all write that down. And then I wait for one, five, four, three, two, one. He says, where is Jorge Palo? And I say, aquí. <laughs> so, uh, they go around screen a day. Okay, it, it, you you see people now. Everybody's screening that day. Um, and on campuses of undergrads, they're doing this. Everybody is doing this. Like a monk re re walking, reading his breviary in the old days. Well, if, if it were that. <laughs> <laughs> the, before all that, the most common thing I used to say to people was good morning. Now I say look up. Okay, <laughs> you're gonna crash into an old person. Okay, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so I measured because I was a dorm chaplain at Georgetown for a long time. I would measure how much noise and exposure they had in their everyday from the time they got up in a dorm until the time they went to bed. Because I was chaplain at the guys in the hallway, and there was a woman at the girls in the hallway, and the boys would keep their doors open, and everybody's going in and out of the and yelling and screaming and all that. 
There is no silence in their day. There is no time when they are not reading a screen, wired up with buds in their ears, listening to a recording, talking on the phone, sitting with people, being in class, doing this, okay? Moving from building to building with their screen addiction, coming back to the dorm to look at porn, you know, and trade notes on stuff, right? Or in the lounge, yelling it up, right to the moment they go to bed. And when they go to bed, they wire themselves up and fall asleep listening to, I don't know, Snow Patrol or something, okay? There is none of this. And what it's done is destroy their ability to be present to each other. Also destroys their ability to engage in conversation. Also destroys their ability to express themselves. So that in class, I have to ban laptops, I have to ban cell phones. I say, don't bring them anymore. They're not going to help you. I want you to engage with me and to engage with each other. Oh, we were never taught how to do that. I, you know, I got it. The world ended in my class. The world came to an end in my class. I had this snotty seminar. I need a book. <clears throat> Here it is. <laughs> uh, 16 kids in the school foreign service, and they're all being trained to be diplomats. But when you're a freshman, you have to take one of these subject seminars in which the professor beats you with a stick to make sure you know how to write and read. Okay. So my topic was genocide and Holocaust, and I bring in five new books every class. Big ones, small ones, scholarly ones, whatever. And there was this one, this new biography by Ulrich about uh, the early Hitler. 700 pages, rough cut edges, beautiful red dust jacket, big thick thing, you know. And I'm saying, I want you to look, I'm passing these around, at least look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Girl takes the book from me, she's thank you, brother. Terribly cool. And she looks at it and she does this. <laughs> <laughs> How do you open it? <laughs> How do you open it? Half the class laughed, the other class half did not, because they wanted to know how you open it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, everything is downloaded into Canvas or Blackboard or other common data banks for students for an entire course. You don't need to read a book or buy one. The professors pre-select everything and put it on the data bank. And all you have to do is download it to your computer. If you want to make a copy for yourself, that's your problem. Who, who needs to handle books if they don't? You know, nobody needs to. The other, the other thing that's really happened, and it destroys kinesthetic learning and disclosure of self, is that I was writing on the board this way. <clears throat> okay, so we'll say something like, Mm-hmm. Anthropology. And this girl says, Father, could you stop that, please? Could you stop that? Are you talking to me? She goes, Yeah, could you stop that? Stop what? She said that. Cursive. She yep. said, What is that? I said, Well, it's cursive. She said, It's really pretty. But how do you are those letters? Do you connect them? What do you do? <laughs> and I said, I don't, I'm not sure I'm getting you. And she said, we're not taught that. We're taught to print. And in second grade, we're taught to keyboard from then on. And you don't need to do that. <laughs> okay. Now, it isn't, I'm not just being old here and, and saying, well, I'm golly, you know, I have a thumb. <laughs> what I'm saying is that all the learning modes that are self-disclosive in their exercise and demand silence and concentration between you and the text or any ability to enforce the idea that writing is a spiritual act and reading is a spiritual act 
have been erased. This erases the general pneumatological way in which all learning was frameworked up in things like the Lasallian method is gone. And to retrieve this, you have to go way underneath. And the farther <laughs> we get away from it, the deeper the retrieval and the stranger it looks to bring it back to young people. Just to piggyback on three points there, <clears throat> at that public college where I've been crucifying myself for five years, uh, I wrote something on the board and a kid said, I can't read your writing. I said, excuse me, in sixth grade, I won the Palmer Method Award. <laughs> yeah, and yet my sister would have had this, this, and that. And he said, the other kid said, no, that's not what he means. I said, what does he mean? What do you mean? Well, that, and I realized these kids are not taught cursive writing. And I said, I said, this is how you express your personality. This, I, I went, they were shocking to them, right? But incapable of reading something like that. Second point, you talk about the personal relationship, huh? This is also very Newmanian. What got Newman into trouble as a tutor at Oxford was when they decided that he was having too much, his expression was, personal influence in the, not the academic life of his students, but in their human and spiritual development. And he was removed as a tutor. And as a result, that's when he left, what, left Oxford. But he didn't see the teaching them or the reading of history, as they say, or whatever, as the primary goal. It was rather he had these young fellows in his house that he felt an obligation to form. And then to the business with iPhones and all the rest, a young woman told me last summer, she's in her early 40s, and she gets together with a group of women, eight or 10 of them, the same age, who have lunch once a month together. And she called me up after, and she said, Father, I had the most bizarre lunch of my life today. I said, what was that? And she said, we sat there having lunch and no one spoke to anyone. I said, 10 women and no one spoke. And she said, no, everyone texted everyone at the table. What do you think of that Chablis? Fab. What do you think of that Caesar salad? Fantastic. They texted each other for two and a half hours. I mean, if we're not sick. Right? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, my point is, you see the Lasallian method, how different it is culturally, anthropologically, spiritually, religiously, technically, and how far away we are in American culture from it. It's not just that. It's that this would have been more of what all Catholic education was for a very long time in some fashion. It might have been a Benedictine one, it might have been the Ratio Studiorum of the Jesuits, it might have been something else. But it would be this, this, a kind of epistemology. Instead now, what's happened, I think, in Catholic Guide is that we've separated these kinds of learnings and ways of knowing. And piety and faith and expression are kind of parallel to each other. The morality is still suffusive throughout the school. We insist on moral behavior, whether you're studying calculus or religion, doesn't matter. And so all of that is there. A spirit is there, which is quite fine. But a way of knowing that forms you from the interior is not there. Final point. <clears throat> I think that, and uh, this goes to Father Chris, of course, I'm fond of saying this, the biggest formator, the biggest educator in all of Catholic life is the liturgy. We are exposed to liturgy more often, more frequently, more repetitively than probably any other single Catholic act. What mass does to shape you interiorly is huge. It's never been quantified or measured. I don't know anybody, any sociology of religion sociologists of religion has ever tried this, is to measure the effect of the Roman rite and your observance of it on participants in it. If the Roman rite is the big picture here, 
the liturgy is the biggest formator, the biggest educator, then this kind of thing coming out of the way in which we worship, we see God, we, we have the Blessed Sacrament, we go to penance, we, we do it, then that, that enforces a whole lifelong style of learning. At the very least, what a Catholic school must do is equip a Catholic kid for continued education in the spiritual life by the way they know how to go to Mass. How to go to Mass and how to go well so that it will deepen. And the Mass will take over. It will take over your life if you let it. But the failure to acquaint them with those skills is a, just a gigantic spiritual education failure. I hope that helps. Yeah. Très bien. Merci beaucoup, mon okay. bon père. <laughs> All right. Father and sister. Once again, we follow Father. <laughs> <laughs> so, if John Bosco were here to say, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> 90 seconds, stretch, oh, 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 come back to 90 seconds. That is what Jesus said. I just want to know how many people have gone from printing their notes to handwriting. <laughs> 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 keep coming back to that. <laughs> You know, they can't also read a clock face. That's right. Oh, wow. That's right. They, yeah. Yeah. Face. they right. only know digital. Digital, digital. that's right. So if you say 10 to 2, they have no clue what that is. You have to but say 150. Yeah. So they that's read right. digital clock face. They don't know how to read a clock face. <laughs> Even our young women in formation coming into formation, you say, you say a quarter to 2, 145. Oh, okay. Because they only know digital time. Okay, now you now that you breathe from top to bottom. Well, <laughs> <laughs> now we have kindergartners wearing Apple watches. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay. So well, one of this so the parents can try the insulin pump, but okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we're done. On on Sundays, I am fortunate enough to go to a lovely parish in Greenwich, Connecticut, for mass on Sunday. Yes, lovely. Uh, with the poor people. With the poor people. I do have poor people all week, so I'll take the rich people on Sunday. Um, <laughs> and one of the people who goes to the 7 o'clock mass every Sunday, she, she is of Italian background, her husband's of Irish background. And she was one of the first women to go to Fordham. And she was one of the first women to graduate from Fordham Law School. And uh, she, is, uh, she is of Italian background. And when Pope Francis came to uh, the United States, she said to me one Sunday after mass, she says, isn't it great the Jesuits are finally getting their due? He <laughs> said, Rosemary, stop. <laughs> Let me tell you a few things. He said, first of all, the Pope's parents were brought together by a Salesian. The Pope's parents were married by a Salesian. The, uh, the, Pope, the Pope was baptized by a Salesian. The Pope spent the sixth grade in a boarding school in Buenos Aires run by the Salesians. The Pope got his vocational discernment, the, the priest who helped him along in his vocational discernment was a Salesian. And she goes, well. First time I ever had her speechless. She, she said, uh, well, at least the Jesuits gave him his Jesuit heart. I said, no, Rosemary. He got that from the Salesians too. <laughs> so you're really lost. And the Salesians are happy the Pope is coming to this country. And actually, if, if I had had a little more foresight uh, for this, and if I had known that we would have, that, we, that Pope Francis was going to come up with this, he wrote an outstanding four page, oh, actually, it was than four pages, article about the year he spent in the sixth grade. In, I have it for distribution. Oh, do you really? You have it? Oh, okay. uh, it's somewhere in the box. Oh, somewhere in the box. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and again. Which is which is actually <coughs> it is actually the best, greatest. English um, uh, uncovering of what Salesian education in a school actually is. Every and so he was in a boarding school in 1949, which is still open, which has no Salesians in it now, but which is still open and still in the Salesian orbit. But he talks about study, piety, recreation, 
guidance, the element of the community that was there, the young scholastics, the retired priests, the rector, uh, the skills that he learned and how this helped him. He only spent this one year in this, in this school, but it really is the finest uh, English piece on Salish education that I've ever come across. So, oh, good, I'm glad you did it. Uh, good. So, so, to piggyback a little bit off uh, Father, Father Dennis from uh, a little while ago, um, you know, if you know anything about Don Bosco at all, you know, he spent his whole life working with, with young people in, in varied settings. And it's important to realize, I think, that Don Bosco did not start in a school. This was not, he did not, he did not start, he did not start the Society of St. Francis de Sales to be school people. He didn't, uh, he didn't, uh, but like, like John Baptist de LaSalle, like Marcel Champagne, like Edmund Rice, uh, he saw young boys, especially, in need and uncatechized and unevangelized. <laughs> now, John Bosco, when he was eight years old, he and his mother uh, were on a dirt road outside of the little town of Becky, where he where he grew up, up in, up in the Alps of Turin, and he passed, they passed a priest on the road going the opposite direction. And he said hello to the priest, and the priest didn't answer back. And he complained to his mother that, uh, no, no, that priest didn't say hello back. And mother says, well, you know, priests are busy about many things, and they don't have time for little kids. And his response to his mother was, when I'm a priest, I will always have time for boys. Uh, so even when he was eight, this, this idea was already, in some way, formulating in, in, in his mind. Um, so he meets this priest when he is eight. As an adolescent, and a, you know, as an adolescent, he is bringing the boys, uh, maybe the girls too, but bringing the boys in his neighborhood, uh, where he lived in, in this little town of Becky, together to to. Uh, he learned how to be a tightrope walker. He learned how to be a juggler. He learned how to be an acrobat. And so he'd have show. He'd have shows, but the the admission was a decade of the rosary. And if you didn't want to say that decade of the rosary, you couldn't come to the show. So. Um, so this is how we got how we got the kids in the in the in the hamlet there to uh, to pray by 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 inviting them to come to the show, but to start by praying a deck of the rosary. So even so, even there, he's, he's got this sort of he's got this evangelical witness and eye towards uh, young people. When he was ordained in 1841, you know, in those days, your bishop didn't assign you. You got offers, and then you took one or or actually, there's so many priests in Piedmont. That's a lot of priests actually lived at home and didn't have assignments. So he had about three offers, and his spiritual director, who was St. Joseph Cafaso, said, uh, don't take any of them. Don't take being the tutor to the rich kid in Genoa. Don't take going to this parish in Castle Nuovo. He says, come to Turin and stay here and come to a place called the Convito Ecclesiastico, which was sort of a, a pastoral institute for priests to learn how to become, to, how to, how to become priests. And um, so... No, in those days, you, know, you had you couldn't uh, hear confessions, so you so you uh, pass the test for for uh, hearing confessions. So he uh, it's a, a moral theology test. So he went back to so he went there and stayed there. And while he is a student at the Convito Ecclesiastico, which was based on the theology of Saint Alphonsus, he uh, this this is when he met the first the first boy that was going to begin the the. Um, uh, his his uh, his mission and, and his ministry. So um, he had been going with Saint Joseph Cafaso to prisons, and he was always repulsed by how by how these men wound up in such bad situations. And he realized that that by the time you were an adult, it was it was too late. It was too, you were too old. So go back. To as young as you possibly could. And in the Church of St. Francis of Assisi in Turin, he meets the first boy who was just trying to get out of the cold. And uh, that's how the Salesian uh, bishop began uh, by befriending this kid from the sacraments, beating him over the head with a broom. Um, and so he invites the boy to come back on Sunday. Now, the kid is homeless. He comes from the country. And who's, you know, is the boy going to come back? Who knows? Where did the kid live? The kid lived where he was able to find a place to put his head at night. But he does come back on Sunday, and he brought somebody else with him. So, young, zealous Father Don Bosco uh, begins what is called the oratory, and he chooses as the patron of the oratory, St. Francis de Sales. And for Don Bosco, the oratory was a place 
where boys could come to pray and to play. And this is what he did on Sundays. They came for some of the instruction, they came for mass, they came for games, they came uh, uh, perhaps to, to uh, for sacramental prep, uh, they would go on hikes, uh, he'd give them a, a, something to eat, he'd give them a blessing, he'd give them a good word, he'd say, come back next week. And this is how the oratory began to grow. And Tabasco really, and after a while he realized that uh, most of these kids didn't know how to read and write, so he started night school, so a little Italian grammar, a little writing, a little uh, mathematics, a little uh, uh, religion, uh, music, uh, but it was nothing. There was nothing set up. It was. It was. Uh, it was sort of patches. Sort of. Sort of patches. Patch, patch. Um, and so, this is how the process of of the Salesian method, of the Salesian ministry, comes into uh, comes into being. It is. It is through meeting the needs of young people as they became apparent to him on a daily basis. Kids had uh, kids got jobs. He would go to their jobs to see, make sure they were being treated properly. He would try to make arrangements with uh, contracts with uh, with the employers. All these, all these things, and and edu not education, but school work was just part of that. And if, from our point of view, later on, if we want to say, okay, what was the basis of Don Bosco's? spirituality it really is the spirituality of francis de sales which is what we see in the pope's latest letter and which is what we see you know what francis de sales makes popular is the idea that holiness is for everybody and regardless of what you are or who you are whatever your state in life is you are called to be a saint and the saint and to be a saint according to your own state in life you know the introduction to about, about life says that very clearly and then the sales goes on to say that what Don Bosco did was take that and bring it down to a kid level a young person's level and that is the proposition that he makes to his young people that in so many words sometimes directly perhaps more indirectly you are called to become saints and how does that occur that occurs from doing your best in the ordinary aspects of daily life for the for his his uh, colleagues that is by being the best um assistant uh that you possibly can 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 come to be that is that is um that is that is the basic spirituality of francis to say of uh, don bosco using francis to sales and then we need to and he, then he real, realizes along that he needs to have a school. First, he has a trade school, then he has an academic school. And then finally, the Salesian Society begins when Don Bosco realizes, I need a permanent group of people who will do this with me after I have <laughs> He had plenty of experiments where people came out, they stayed three weeks, they stayed two months, oh, these boys are too hard, these boys are too noisy, these boys are too unruly, have a nice life, and uh, off, they would, off they would go to the diocese or someplace else. But, but, and, and, and Don Bosco, like, the, like uh, Ignatius, but, uh, and something my father was alluding to before. So what do you, what, what do you, and in our rule, what does it say? The Salesian is supposed to become a contemplative in action, seeing God in the midst of people and things and life around them. You know, the Jesuits have that great spiritual exercise of the examen of consciousness. And one of my nephews, two of my nephews, I graduated from Loyola Academy in Wilmette outside of Chicago. And my older nephew, when he was a freshman, calls me up and he says, well, Uncle John, what is the examen of consciousness? And stupid me said, oh, you mean the examination of conscience? No, no, uncle. I mean the examination, the examen of consciousness. And I said, well, I know what it means. Why don't you explain it to me? And so he says, it's an exercise where you try to find, where you're looking to find out where did you meet God in the course of your day or your week? And I was like, wow, he's in the ninth grade. How did you figure this out already? And uh, I said, where'd you learn that? He said, I learned it in my formation class. And I used the word formation. And I thought, we're trying to make young Jesuits out of uh, my nephew already in the ninth grade? I said, well, that couldn't possibly be. And I, he, <laughs> said, he, he said, he said, I said, you want to come to Jesuit? He goes, oh, no, no. He says, uh, we learned this in our group guidance class. 
I said, oh, that's really interesting. This is the whole school does it every week. 2,100 kids in the school, about 150 adults. The whole school stopped. And they did it over the PA. They asked the questions and made people stop and think for, for several minutes each week. So I was living here in uh, Orange, and I was helping at a parish in Chatham on Sundays, and kids would go to Regis or St. Peter's Prep or Xavier High School. I would stop them and say, what's the name of consciousness? And they would explain it. Kid went to St. Peter's, went to Regis, explained it. Every Jesuit school across the country teaches their kids how to do the, the, the exam of consciousness. And every school does it on whatever cycle that they want to do it. And I thought it was a great, I thought that was a great exercise that the Jesuits do to teach their kids how to do take the spiritual exercise with them for the rest of their lives. And there's no book, no time, no paper, just, uh, no book, no, no paper, just a little bit of time and some silence. And Don also says the same thing to us that we have that the formation period has to be a time of silence. And in the older days, there were those times of silence in the day to ref not only to reflect, but to pray. And sometimes Don also didn't give people a lot of time to do that, but you have to do it as you are able to, or as the schedule goes, to make those visits of the Blessed Sacrament where you're able to do this, and then take what you have and bring it to the boys. And, uh, and out of all of this, and Don Bosco devises this, I wouldn't say he devises methodology. Somebody writes to us and says, tell us how you have been so successful in dealing with thousands of young boys. And he's, he's, out of, he's in France, and he has to give this talk. Well, he didn't write it out. He took an envelope, and he scratched out some notes, and he wrote what we refer to now as the treatise on the preventive system. He wrote it right there before he had got them given. But it was all based on the experience he had of working with young people over 35 years. And none of it, even though by that time we had boarding schools everywhere, none of it refers to anything in the classroom. Because that's not what Don Bosco was interested in. Don Bosco was interested in school as a means of helping young people become saints. Actually, Don Bosco took his class ideas from the brothers because he had, there was a big brother school, school there, I think, big brother school in Turin. A lot of the boys from the brother school in Turin came to the oratory at the school. And Don Bosco was friendly with the headmaster there and took some of the classroom ideas, but Don Bosco didn't write anything about that. It all has to do with uh, the spiritual, moral, community dimensions, which um, I don't want you to think that you're the only one with the handouts today. Um, Sister Teresa is going to talk about the uh, the uh, diagram there in in a minute. Just to let you, but on the first on the first page in here, this short piece here, there was a um, there was a, a, a French diocesan priest in the fifties uh, who worked with uh, street kids and at-risk youth. He was not a Salesian; he was a diocesan priest. And he's speaking to a group of young Salesians uh, and, tell, and he tells them from his experience as a diocesan priest working with street kids in Paris, um, how important Don Bosco's method is that even if we had to lose every other, if we had to lose every work, every institution, every school, what is most fundamentally Salesian is the process, the method, the system, and not the buildings or the institutions themselves. And that if we lost every single school that we have, we would still be able to be Salesians and, and uh, because of what Don Bosco wanted us to do. If you open to the next page then, that's who you are, yes. Um, everything that you need to know about what it means to be a, uh, the Salesian education system is written right in this creed right here. Um, 
I don't know who wrote it, but I thought they did a really good job. And then after that, Sister Teresa, take it away. Thank you. I just want to say who we are first, how we came into the picture. While you were speaking about the STVs, after Don Bosco had founded the congregation of men, priests and brothers, uh, there were people that started telling him, what about the other half of humanity? You know, there are girls that need help too and are at risk. And at that time, men's girls were not educated. They were really at risk. So he didn't want to be bothered because he had enough trouble trying to feed all the boys and trying to get his congregation approved of the men. But eventually he did meet a young woman from a little village similar to his own uh, and a group of young women who had already been doing a ministry among girls, especially girls who didn't have a mother or were in difficult situations. And um, by the Holy Spirit bringing together, she had the same spirituality as Don Bosco. Her name was Mary Mazzarella, St. Mary Mazzarella, from a little village called Marnese, similar to the village Don Bosco came from, Becky. And the, the beautiful thing is that we always speak of twin charisms. It's like the Holy Spirit raised the two of them up and then brought them together. And he brought them together through a train ride when Don Bosco was on his way to a meeting, a diocesan meeting, in the Diocese of Acqui in Italy, the pastor of the parish where Mary Mazzarella and her other women that belonged to this group that were doing this good in the village uh, came from, they met on the train and they started talking, where do you come from, where do you come from? And the other priests started telling Don Bosco about this group of young women and what they were doing. And the spirit brought him eventually, he, he went to the village, he met them and the rest is history. And here we are, Salesian Sisters, or as Don Bosco, the official title, because Don Bosco had a great devotion to Mary under the title Help of Christians. So officially, we are the daughters of Mary Help of Christians, popularly known as the Salesian Sisters. Okay, so just to tell you who we are. Okay, looking at this diagram, I'm going to bring out a few points, and I'll try to do it quickly. I know our time is very, very late, but... Um, if you look at your little diagram, we did this in order to make it graphically perhaps easier to put it all together. The um, rectangle outside, the outside there, is meant to be the environment. Don Bosco is very much on creating an environment. And in all of our works, we try to create an environment that has these characteristics. If you look at the top on the left side, it says oratory criteria. When we speak of, we speak of having an oratorian heart, which means that from within us, from within our heart, come these elements. Anytime we work with young people in whatever situation, whether it's a school, whether it's a religious ed program, a summer camp, youth ministry, retreat center, whatever it might be, we want it to be a home. In other words, somewhere where young people feel loved, safe, at home and that they can make a contribution and they are really uh, part of <clears throat> the whole process. It's not something done to them, but we work together and we form this environment with the young people. Then a school, and by here we don't mean only academic school, but the idea of learning, that wherever we are, we learn for life. We learn life lessons in addition to the academics, which are part of the school. <clears throat> And um, I was just talking to our counselors at our summer camp the other day. We're doing a formative journey with them and uh, telling them that what are some of the lessons that you teach the children? Life lessons, you teach them how to share. You teach them how to wait their turn. You teach them how to respect each other. You teach them how to develop their skills and abilities, how to help one another. Those are all life lessons. So the idea that a learning environment, whether it is academic learning in a school, which is very important if you're in a school environment, but in every environment, we want young people to learn and to grow. Parish, meaning faith community. And for Don Bosco, again, the, the faith community was extremely important. And he also was very big about having young people serve other young people. So he would get the, the boys who were more open to spirituality, <laughs> to prayer, to the sacraments, and they would work on the new boys that came in and try to encourage them to go to confession, try to encourage them to come for prayer and so on, so that the young people themselves also took an ownership of the of creating the environment. And finally, playground. Young people have to have fun. And he used to tell them, play, run, jump, yell, do whatever you have to do, 
He made sure that there was music and drama and all kinds of sports and all kinds of things that young people enjoy. And that's what we try to create in all of our environments, as long as you don't offend God. So learning that faith and fun go together and that God wants us to be happy. And it brings me back to Francis de Sales. One of his wonderful sayings that I love very much was, be who you are and be that well. So you're a young person, be who you are and be that well. You're a parent, you're whoever you are, be who you are and be that well. So these are the four elements of what we call the oratorian criterion or the oratorian heart. Then if you move to the right side, the qualities, the interior qualities that make that possible are cheerfulness and joy. This is one of the great characteristics uh, that Don Bosco wanted us to have because working with young people, young people need joy. Young people need to realize that knowing God loves us makes us happy. And because we know God loves us, we are happy people. We are trusting people. We are joyful people. And that cheerfulness and that joy, that spirit of faith, that seeking God in everything, Father John mentioned before, the presence of God. And Father Dennis also mentioned the idea of presence. Okay, I remember in all of our classrooms, we put the sign, God sees you and loves you. And not the idea God sees you like God's there waiting to stop you if you do something wrong. But the way I always told the kids is God loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. When you love someone, you keep looking at them. When parents get a new baby, what do they do? Every time the baby moves or breathes or does something, everybody's there. So God loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. That concept of that faith, that trust in God, that God's love is what makes us able to be happy. Then the spirituality, which is particularly spirituality of Francis de Sales. The spirituality of ordinary life. Ordinary life as the place where we meet God. God present, and Father went back to the examine of consciousness. Right, where did I meet God today? That concept of meeting God in ordinary life. Joy and optimism. Friendship with Jesus. And here comes the whole idea of sacramental life. So Don Bosco gave tremendous importance to the sacramental life, to the Eucharist and to reconciliation. He called them the pillars on which his educational system was founded. Okay. <clears throat> Communion with the church, the idea of being church and being this faith community and being of service. And that last point, responsible service. So all of that in the context of the sacramental life and the devotion to Mary, the first and most faithful disciple of Jesus. The Marian devotion was also great element. Pope Francis in that article speaks about that he learned in Salesian life devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, to Mary, help of Christians, and love for the Pope. So those are the three elements, love for the church, another very important element of Don Bosco's spirituality. <clears throat> in this center, you see the uh, triangle, okay, the Trinitarian model. And because Don Bosco's whole system is relational, is based on relationships, Okay. The first relationship, if you go to the top of the triangle, <clears throat> within that circle is the inner life of the Trinity, God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we know that the Trinitarian model is the basis of our unity, our relationships, our communion with one another. The inner life of the Trinity, that is the life of sharing of love, giving love and receiving love, that gratuitous giving and receiving of love in mutuality is the inner life of the Trinity. That is the model for all of our relationships. So every community, every family, every religious community, every parish community, every school, every classroom, every religious ed program, every summer camp, whatever it might be, should be a community where there is relationships of mutual giving and receiving, mutual love. And so if you go down, you'll see on the left side, educators. And you'll see the elements that were mentioned before, what Don Bosco called the preventive system, reason, religion, and kindness. And then that very important element of presence. Okay. This educators is not just teachers in a school. Again, anyone who works with young people in the broader sense of education as bringing out what is best in the person. So parents are also part of this. And so the, uh, our laity, our parents, we speak about the core community being the religious community that then opens out to include our lay collaborators, parents, everyone who's involved. And so we call it the educating community or the pastoral community. 
that is enlarged beyond the religious community, but the religious community is the nucleus. <clears throat> then if you move up, it says relationships within the angles and among the angles. So within the Trinity, within the educators themselves, among themselves, and then of course, in the right side, the angle down in the right side with that circle, the young people. And you'll notice that the arrows go to and from each of those groups. So that is a constant interaction of that relationships. So the, uh, the idea of presence here, engaging and motivating. There is a, a beautiful story in uh, many stories in Damascus life, but one of them I'd like to share with you. And that is that one of the seminarians who was in training and was in a classroom with the kids and was very discouraged because things were not going well in discipline and so on. He was having a hard time. So he went to Dombusco, he was upset, and Dombusco said, you're upset, and he told him why. And Dombusco said, go to the pump. The boys used to be outside getting a little roll of bread in the morning, and they would go to the pump to get the water. And so he would tell them, go to the pump. That's where you meet the kids outside the classroom. And that's where you can be friends with them, you can have a relationship with them, and that will carry over into your working in the classroom. Go to the pump. Another time, another seminarian that was discouraged, Dombosco said, do you pray for your boys? Oh, I never thought about doing that. So, you know, this very simple approach to relationships, this very simple approach to love. So Dombosco also said, and I'll close with this, love what they love so that they can then love what you love and what you want. And it's not enough for them to be loved. They have to know they're loved. And they know that by the way we treat them. Thank you. God bless you. I don't know if Father, you want to add anything. Do I need anything out? Well, we have volumes out. Well, we have volumes out, but I mean, what we had agreed on doing. Good. Okay. Do you have any questions, comments? So two things, sister. One, uh, sister talks about having kids relate to kids. Uh, I would suggest two things. Uh, I've seen this a very, very effective. For example, at Atonement Academy in San Antonio. It's a pre-K to 12 school. The kids go to mass every day. And one of the things that's done is a senior is assigned to a kindergartner or a first grade student, and sits with the kid at mass, <laughs> and is a, a, a mentor to the child. It gives that senior an opportunity to be a big brother or a big sister uh, and to already engage in some aspect of responsibility for pastoral care, in effect, and and to watch those older kids, how they take care of the little ones, and how when the little one has a problem, he'll ask to go to the upper school <laughs> to talk to that kid, right? And and so and but that can be done in the K to eight operation yes, just yes. as easily, right? Yes. Uh, and then the other sister talks about praying for the children. When I was in uh, third grade, uh, and I was always very an inquisitive little kid, and I noticed that Sister Vera had a black binder on her desk, and I would snoop over, and, and it was this list of names, and I noticed that she would turn the page every day. And so finally one day I said, Sister, what is that? And she said, oh, you're going to be in that at the end of the year. I said, what does that mean? And she said, I have the name of every child I've ever taught. At that point, it was about 50 years. And she said, and so there are 25 names on the page. And today I'm praying for these children. I don't know who they are or where they are now, but these are the 25 of my former students that I pray for today. I turn the page and the next 25 kids. What a marvelous thing, huh? And, uh, and I think that's, again, something that we can tell our, our teachers to do, and something we as, as clergy ought to be doing. But it's a realization that it is something more than making sure they pass a state test, right? That's the ultimate test that we're praying about. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else for Any other comment or question? the fathers or sister? Yeah. Um, just kind of like you said at the end, love what they love. So that they can love what you love. Yeah. What is good, of course, that they love. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's kind of a struggle that I've had. Like a lot of the kids, a lot of what they're into, I'm just kind of opposed to. Yeah. yeah. And you need and, to. And be. again, yeah. they need guidance and direction. Let me give you a real quick example. One time at our summer, one of our summer camps, uh, the girls were playing music from Madonna, and it was the song "I'm Just a Material Girl." 
So they said, Sister, come and listen to this. So I listened to it. Now, the good thing is, see, if you're open with them and they have a relationship with you, they'll share with you. And it gives you a chance to give them direction. So I listened to it. And I said, well, what do you like about that? I said, we like the beat. Okay. So I said, and what about the words? Well, I don't listen too much to the words. But then I said, let's listen to the words a minute. And when they said, I said, is that how you feel? You really want to be just material? Just, no, not really. You know, so sometimes we can, if we have an openness and a relationship with them, we can kind of guide them and direct them and make them think okay? in, a, in a very pleasant way. Not say, you should listen to that. Because if you do that, it turns them off. So, but love what they love in the sense that, you know, kids love you to come to their basketball games. Kids love to have different kinds of um, activities or things that, you know, they'll enjoy. Okay. Whenever we have a feast day, we always give ice cream free in the cafeteria. Oh, they love that. And it makes them remember that's a feast day. Okay. There are other ty types of things we can do to help them understand that we want them to be happy and they can enjoy at the same time when we do that that they will also be able to accept what we ask of them. So it it helps in having that open relationship. And like I said, if you're open with them and you don't just put down everything they're doing, it will give the chance for that they will feel open to share with you. And then you can give them some kind of direction and help them think. They don't think. They don't realize certain things. They're not aware. I also gave high school kids two exercises uh, once a year. One, I asked them, assigned them to watch one channel of television from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. and to tick off every five minutes that any commandment was violated. Uh, and what's it do? It's teaching them, if you tell them don't watch television, that's going to work. But you make them critical observers of it and it changes the focus entirely. Similarly, I would say, I want you to take your favorite rock song, whatever it is, write out the lyrics and analyze them. And exactly Sister's point, 90% of them couldn't even tell you what the lyrics were, or they mouth something and be pre-conscious or yeah. unconscious yeah. about it. Yeah. And then they'd say, well, that's pretty bad. And, and so you end up making them the observers of the yeah. process, Make them realize and, and they come to the conclusion. Yeah. Father John, you yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll say something like that. But it goes back to what was said this morning. You have to be present first. Yeah. Yeah. You just yeah. you have to build a relationship first. You just can't condemn what is there. No. So uh, what do kids want? What, all the, what, what do we all want? Everybody wants to be recognized and accepted, <laughs> especially by kids, especially by an adult. Not just their peers, but also by an adult. And you may... You know, so so like uh, Maureen said this morning, the fact that she went with baby and toe to the <laughs> basketball game that made people sit up and take that made people sit up and take notice. They just can't do that once a year. But the other word that goes along with presence is engagement. Uh, how do we engage? And it doesn't have to be always by doing kid things or getting interested in kid things. But some of those things, you know, we would like them to. To stay away from that, but how do we do, how do we just engage them in conversation? I think a lot of adults are afraid to do that. Um, there was something in there's a great website of, for educational purposes called Edutopia, and when I was saying this morning about even in public education building the, these relationships, Edutopia had a page of ten ways to build relationships with kids without talking about school. I think mean, this is ten other things. So that's, that's one thing. On the last page, which we didn't talk about, because I put it last minute, I said, I, said I, I, did, I did this with from the Salesian Sisters, actually, to talk about what does it mean to be a Salesian school, and what makes a Salesian school different. And I talked about the same things that are on, that are on, the, on the diagram. But in the notes where it says, G in the last, uh, the last um, bullet, it says, letter from Rome. Now, Oscar writes his letter when he's in Rome back to Turin to the oratory. And he has this dream, and he and two people appear in the dream, but one person says, Do you want to see the oratory before 1870? And now Oscar says, sure. And they show the oratory playground 
full of life, kids playing games, running around, doing all types of things. And the second person says, you want to see what the oratory is like now? And Dallas says, sure, I've been away for a month. I would have saw it. And the recreation is sort of listless and people are getting into trouble and having bad thoughts and all that. And so the guide in the dream says, so now, Oscar, what's the difference? And Oscar doesn't know what the difference is. He says, look and see. He says, look, you've been doing this for 40 years. What is the difference? He says, in the first picture, the Salesians are there. They're in the midst of the kids. They're leading the recreation. Uh, they're being involved one way or the other. What do you see in the second picture? He says, oh, no Salesians are in there. They're all out, and they're all out and around, talking among themselves, not paying much attention to what's going on in the, in, 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 in the playground. And so he goes, so it goes back. So this vision, and so really what it is, is a, is a rebuke to the Salesians in 1884 that, you know what? You guys are not doing what you're supposed to be doing at, in the Salesian setup. You're not, you may be present, but you're not engaged. You're not in there. You're not, you're not listening. You're not talking. You're not guiding. You're not playing. You're not doing any of that. You, take, you put yourself on the perimeter. And... Personally, my, my personal opinion is, is is that the idea of presence is the most important part in the Salesian methodology, in the, in the, in the Salesian method system. And it's the one that is the hardest one to practice. Uh, and where does this happen? Where do you have to be present? You have to be present where the kids are. And so almost every Salesian school in this country, talk, you know, we, all, we all refer to ourselves as a home school parish of playground. It's in all of our mission statements. Nobody told us to do that, but that's how it's turned out. <laughs> and when I say playground is an important part of the edging of process, some of our parents who are coming to an open house looking say, really? Is that part of the same thing with George Washington? Really? Playground? And sometimes people think, I said, well, you have to have recreation. You have to play as part of the edging of process. Don Bosco saw that as the best time to talk to kids, to do them what he used to call an Italian uh, La parola del recchio, a little word in the ear, not a brow beating, but a little word about what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. If you ever read the book, The One Minute Manager by Ken Blanchard, which came out 40 years ago, and it's a management classic, he says there are three things one minute praisings, one minute corrections, and one minute goal setting. Well, you know what? Teachers talk much too long, so punishments of 15, you know, you, you harangue a group of kids for 15 minutes, they love that. Why? Because you're just taking 15 minutes out of class time. <laughs> but one minute praisings specific on what you did right, one minute correction on what you need to improve of. This is what I see. And then one, one, one minute goal settings. But that's the even for a kid. One, one minute goal settings. Mm -hmm. But the presence and the engagement, that is, that is the key. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we're going Thank to Thank you take very it. much. God bless you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.